afternoon, everyone. My name is Kenny Aragon. I'll be moderating this session. Uh, this is Improving Skinning, Theming, and Front-End Development Workflows, and will be presented by Michael Green. Michael leads the Learning Technology Services and Strategy Team at Duke Learning Innovation and contributes to the front-end and design and development of Sakai. Please remember to mute yourselves if you're not speaking to avoid any distracting background noise. We have set the rooms uh, participants upon to mute upon entry, but you can always unmute yourself to ask questions. Just make sure that you uh, mute back. If you have any questions, enter them in the chat box. You can enter questions at any time and we'll address those um, either during or after, depending on how Michael wants to handle that. This session is being recorded and will be available at a later date on the Sakai YouTube channel. Uh, if you have any problems with video or audio, enter a comment in the chat box. And with that, I'll hand it over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Kenny. Um, yeah, and so this is a birds of a feather, so it, it's pretty informal. I've got a couple minutes up front just with some thoughts of, of, of where I'm at with front end and, and the in my workflows and whatnot. Um, but I, I, you know, I encourage everyone, raise your hand, unmute, type in the chat. I want this to be as back and forth as, as a group discussion as we can uh, make it. Um, so with, with that, I'll just kind of uh, jump in here to, to get you a little bit of info on, on where I'm coming from. So um, I work at Duke and Duke's been uh, on Sakai for Eight, eight, eight years or so now, eight, nine years. Um, and I've been at Duke five years, but I've not been involved with the Sakai community for that long. It's really only been uh, recently, the past couple of years that I've really dug in and started to, to become a contributor and, um, and understand the code base and, and how the product actually works. And my background is not in Java, maybe in Tomcat. So I am least familiar with those tools, which are slightly important to our code base. <laughs> and, um, and I'm more familiar with front end tools um, and I'm becoming increasingly more familiar with uh, Docker. And so that's kind of where my strong suits uh, lie. And that's where I tend to focus when I interact with the community. So I'm working with uh, Sean uh, Foster, who's on the call. We're doing a lot of front end work and I've been involved with the Switch project, if that's a project that um, that you're familiar with. And so um, my, um, so previously over the past couple of years, because I didn't have that Java background and because I was trying to get involved with Duke's instance of Sakai, uh, I had a really strange workflow or maybe, I don't know if you would think it was strange or not. I, I think if you were a Java developer, you might think this is a strange workflow because it seems very roundabout, um, but it was what has made sense to me because I didn't have that knowledge. And so I actually developed our Sakai skins with no local host Sakai. And um, I have a bunch, uh, this repo that's listed here has a bunch of shell scripts and a bunch of node scripts that emulate what is actually happening in the Maven palm file under library. Um, it just doesn't do it with Maven and it does it um, with node and NPM. And, and then there's a really cool feature that came out a couple of years ago in Chrome called local overrides that I may actually do a quick demo of because it, even if, um, even if you have Sakai localhost, this is an interesting feature. So under the sources tab in, um, in Chrome DevTools, Actually, let me let me get something up from the network. So let's say I'm going to do some work on head scripts because I'm trying to figure out something. You can actually open up something from the sources panel, and over here, oops, sorry, over here, there's there's other options, and overrides is one of them. And if you um, click this select folder for overrides, I'll just like dump it in my downloads real quick. It will I'll ask for file permission. And then now it will allow you, and this is on my localhost, but I could do this. Maybe it'd be a better, uh, let me just go to, well, not, not direct, sorry. We'll just go straight to uh, production kind of thing you would never do, right? You would never just like edit live in production. Um, there we go.
cool. So we'll just go grab head scripts from production and uh, and then I'll do right click here, save for overrides, right? And now I've got a clone of this on my local drive that when I save changes to it will actually override the server version just for me, right? I'm not actually editing on production. I'm not affecting anybody else except for me while I have Chrome DevTools open. But this is a really handy way to just do things, try things. And that was actually what I was doing. I had all these node workflows that would do things in VS Code, it'd build library, and then it'd ship it to a specific folder. And then Chrome was looking at this folder saying, oh, cool, I see a new file update. And then it would use that um, for me while I was doing my dev test environment instead of uh, what was on the server. And then when I had something ready, I would do a PR to this repo. And then Kenny, I, I believe, is, uh, has got some jobs on the long side end that automatically uh, scrapes uh, that repo whenever there's an update. And I've got some Travis workflows on my end to kind of automatically put them in the place he's going to look for. And that's what we've been doing uh, with our workflows for the past two years. It's a prior, this really Sakai um, 11, 12, 19. That's, that's what I've been doing. And I do want to give a big shout out. I don't know if anybody from this team is on the call, but um, the the Vula team, I got a ton of inspiration from this repo leaked, linked here. Um, uh, it was a good gap bridger for me because I understood the like grub and the, the node side of what they were doing, but I didn't understand the Sakai side and they really helped me understand. So uh, I'd recommend checking out either of those things. That is not what I'm trying to do anymore. Um, and, and now I have uh, really grown accustomed to the Sakai uh, Docker. There's several flavors of Docker for Sakai. And if you haven't tried one of them, I, I'd highly recommend it. I have this philosophy on my development machine now where I, I want to install as little as possible outside of a container. So pretty much the only thing I install outside of a container is VS Code and Docker. And I don't have anything else. I mean, whatever comes with the OS I have, but I don't install anything else outside of a container. So uh, under the Sakai project, there is a Docker folder and that is currently what I'm using. I've actually copied those files um, in that project to a separate repo that I edit so that when I mess with that, I don't have multiple copies of the Sakai source code. Um, and, uh, and this, if you've not messed with this, it's a really interesting stack. It has a proxy uh, that sits in front of you know, each image and each of these kind of uh, squares is a container, right? So there's a Maven container that builds, a Tomcat that runs a SQL database. Um, and then there's a bunch of like side um, or optional services that you can run based on which image you use. And, um, and so I'm using currently the, the as one of the middle tiers uh, because every now and then I like using PHP my admin instead of just like a SQL query. Um, and, and I have a this is this whole thing is inside a swarm. Uh, and I have one of these for each major version of Sakai now. So if I have to do you know, Duke's current production is on Sakai 19. Uh, so I have a Sakai 19 version. Um, we're getting ready to upgrade to 20, so I have one for that, and then I have one for um, Master or 21, whatever you know, whatever that is. And um, and I am not a Docker Pro, so I think there's probably some efficiencies I can gain by not having quite this much duplication. I just couldn't think of another way around it, and I also couldn't quite wrap my brain around the HA proxy, so I replaced that with an Nginx proxy that sits in front of all of these on my machine that allows me to use, uh, you might have seen it a second ago when I was doing this, I just have sakai.localhost instead of IP addresses because I was running into issues trying to run multiple versions at the same time, making edits between them and that they were conflicting with each other. So now I have sakai localhost versus I think 20x.sakai.localhost. Yeah, so, and I don't have any issues like building those um, at the same time and bouncing back and forth. Um, and then I still have a repo that is an updated version of all of those node scripts that is, is more in tuned to what the Sakai actual core code base is. And I'm trying to think through what I would like as a developer to bring in from that external repo 
into the Sakai core code base. And one of the main things I use that for is uh, watching files. So my main workflow when I'm doing front end development is I, um, I do an NPM install on this to get any, you know, get all my libraries. And then I have a watch script that looks inside of library on any of these major versions for a change to a CSS file. It runs the, or a change to a SAS file, it runs the SAS build script. It's a change to the JS file, it runs the JS build script, it's a change to an image file, it you know, minif minifies them or, or whatever. And it puts them in the place that Tomcat is expecting them automatically without me having to go run like Maven, clean install, whatever. And then I, I just save my file and then, you know, I'll tab over to the browser, refresh, and the changes are there. And it's in a matter of like less than a second to maybe maybe a second or two versus, um, you know, 10 to 20 seconds to have to actually rebuild all of library. And so um, for me, it's a much, it, it's increasing my speed um, and that may just be because I don't have a very performant Maven build command, or I'm not, you know, I'm not in tune with how to maximize um, what I can get out of Maven. But um, that's one thing that I, I really like that workflow where I'm just in my editor, edit a SAS file, save, alt tab, refresh, and it's, and it's done. I don't have to really think about building and moving files and any of that. So I, I think that's kind of, so, I mean, that's what I've been up to. Um, I mean, I'm happy to dig into actual code on any of that if you want. I'm happy to dig into, if you saw the lightning talk earlier, CSS custom properties, dark mode, any of that stuff that we've been working on. Um, but that's, you know, that's what I've got to contribute. I would love to see, these are some um, discussion starters that I thought might be interesting for folks to, you know, share what your front end dev looks like. Um, if there are improvements that you'd like to see around, you know, front end development in Sakai, or if there are other projects that you say, oh yeah, you know, I see how you know, people are using Webpack. I don't have any clue how Webpack works. I imagine it does. It sounds like it does a lot of the stuff that I just talked about. I just don't have a clue how it works. So, you know, should we be looking at Webpack or should we be, you know, or not or, or whatever. So I'd, I'd be interested in, you know, where everybody else's brains are at on these topics. Let me ask this, I'll do like an audience poll. How many folks, um, let's do the, give me a, uh, a plus one in the chat. If you are involved in like theming your instance of Sakai at your institution or you're involved in like the front end development parts of Sakai. And when I say front end, I'm mostly thinking CSS and JavaScript. Um, but if you define it differently, please share that as well. If you're involved with that, you know, in your work with Sakai in some capacity. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, I'm Eduardo from University of Murcia. And uh, yeah, uh, I usually uh, edit uh, our skins. Yeah, I see in the chat, there's a couple of us. Yeah, that's one. <laughs> So Eduardo, say, um, do you, and, and you may have a, also have the Java background, so you're more comfortable with the typical workflows. No, I, I am, I'm a front-end developer. Okay. I don't usually uh, develop in Java. So does, does any of what I described resonate with you or are there different workflows that you've? Uh, well, yours is better than mine. Absolutely. <laughs> I just uh, monitor uh, the directory and copy the um, the files that I've been ed editing. But I don't I don't use um, Docker in the at this moment. So yours is better, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Other other folks. 
See folks that do both the front end and the back end. Mm -hmm. Interested in other people's process for editing skins. Yeah, I, I'm I'm with you on that, Sean. That's kind of that's kind of what brought me to the community really was scratching my own itch, right? I was customizing it for Duke and then I was like, well, I'd customize it less for Duke if I got to the core community and you know and then contributed there. So that's what brought me here. Kenny, I know, um, I mean, I know Longside has to edit a wide variety of skins, I, I imagine, for, for your clients. Is that something that you're involved in, or is that another staff member there that typically uh, handles that? No, that's that's me. Um, yeah, so I, I do all of the, the skin work for, I would say, probably 90% of our clients. And the process I use for that is, so I check out uh, the latest code and just create a branch in our, in our Git. Um, and I create custom CSS files um, for each different skin that I'm going to do. And I build off of that. So I'll use Maven and, and deploy uh, by building library and uh, deploy out to kind of a, uh, deploy out to dev and prod that way. Um, yeah, I think there's been quite a bit of improvements over the last couple versions and from early days of uh, Sakai 11 and 12, or I would say 10 and 11. Um, 12's made a lot of improvements and, and things keep getting better. Uh, I like the uh, being able to just adjust a few variables and uh, build multiple different skins that way. Um, but yeah, my, my process right now is, is very much manual and, and just building each each one and I've created kind of a template that I use that works for most I would say but there are still some that that still want to customize a little more and it just takes a little more work to do um, sometimes there's not a variable that does what they want to do and I'm just overriding CSS so uh, yeah but yeah, I do, I do quite a bit. There's a couple of schools that have multiple skins as well, kind of like uh, you guys do at Duke. Yeah. So it would be nice to have a way to build multiple skins um, without having to build multiple times. I don't know if we've quite gotten there in yeah. 21 yet. I I'm pretty pleased with the improvements, and I'm happy to do some demos uh, around that in a second. Was I was I cutting somebody off? Was somebody getting ready to speak up? I was just going to ask Kenny if he um, if he has clients that have uh, a need for multiple themed themes or skins uh, within a single instance of Sakai. Yes, yes, yeah. we have se several clients that have different skins for uh, different schools, um, different- They're all using the same instance? Yes, yeah. yes. And how, how, do you, how do you accomplish that right now? Um, it's, so there, there are properties you can set in your Sakai properties to allow for a skin selector in site info. So there's one way to, to allow users to do that. Um, it could also be handled you know, with SIS and creating template sites where different templates have different skins. So when you create courses off those templates, they'll have the correct skin. Um, so there's two ways that we handle that. Gotcha. So it's all based on the individual site then? 
yeah, that's yeah. The site. yeah, exactly. So you'd have your your main skin that you'd see kind of when you first enter Sakai or the gateway. Um, but once you access the actual site, that's where you would get your uh, additional skin. Gotcha. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. So if 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 folks have not um, taken a look at the twenty one code base yet. Um, I'll do a quick uh, lightning tour here because we did introduce some pretty big changes to the Morpheus folder there. There's a whole new folder called themes and it's going to come out of the box with a base file that kind of has, if you saw the lightning talk, this is what's generating the like programmatic colors and the programmatic accessibility checking and stuff. Um, but it comes with a, a light theme, a dark theme, and then a custom file that's essentially just all commented out similarly to the way like uh, customization works right now. Um, but one thing you'll notice is that there is still defaults, uh, but there's a little block in here that kind of outlines what we've done. Anything related to theme, background color, border color, all these five things has actually been pulled out of defaults. Um, it's been put into light and it's been re the the SAS variable has been replaced with a CSS custom property, and um, that is what actually allows dark mode to work, um, because you you'd, you would have to rebuild like Kenny was just saying you have to build a completely different skin and deliver that to the to the user if um, if we kept it with SAS. So using CSS custom properties allows us to build one skin to support multiple themes. And we currently in 21 are only really delivering like it's binary light mode, dark mode, but we're already thinking like, well, clearly that's just a phase one, right? I mean, we might want high contrast mode. You might want user uh, defined themes where they're like, you know what I want? I want my Duke Sakai to be green because I like green. And um, so we're, that stuff's not going to make it into 21, but we're kind of thinking through that. And um, so definitely check out, uh, you know, library, Morpheus, uh, SAS themes, uh, if you haven't yet. And this, this gives you a little bit of a sense of kind of the change in direction. And as some folks know, I don't remember who said it in the chat, it's, it's sometimes really difficult to figure out what variable is going to do what in, in um, Morpheus. And um, I've, tried to put a, I've put a lot of effort into, I, don't, I won't say I fixed it, but to try to help that problem because I felt that pain too. Um, there's still pretty much the same number of variables, maybe even more, um, but the ones you actually have to set in order to make a difference are far fewer. And um, it's always dangerous to do a live internet demo. I don't know if I can get this rocking and rolling on the fly, but if I uncomment stuff from over here, let me leave it, leave it commented. Go look at Sakai localhost. So this is out of the box. Uh, we'll uncomment, save. I don't have my node scripts running, so we'll do a Maven build real quick. And because this is the custom theme and in uh, tool.sass, it's the last loaded, it actually will override all the variables set in light. Uh, we did it that way because I was just trying to avoid people uh, having to touch. Uh, I wanted you to have to touch as few files as possible to make a difference. You can come in here and do whatever you want, of course. But um, the idea being you could just uncomment that file, make a change, and then now your Sakai is green, right? And um, that go away zoom. Uh, that custom file has about 10 different variables that it sets. But the one that really matters is, is this one, where I, I use this new function where we're going to define a custom color palette. And so if I change this to like 170 hue, I have no clue what this will be. 40, 35, we'll save, rebuild that. This, this uh, it creates that whole color palette. Um, and then it, you know, all the variables are set to inherit from that color palette, the various shades. So it's not just one tone, it's 15 tones in total that it generates that gives you hover states, active states, um, all, all of that good stuff. What do we end up with here? So some kind of pretty cyan-y kind of thing. So the idea being you could essentially just change one line 
set that to your institution's brand primary color and go from there. It probably won't be enough. You probably want to edit a couple more lines, but you know, hopefully that's that feels better than it was previously. There's a bunch of stuff in chat I need to catch up on now. And other folks, feel free to ch chime in. I'll be quiet for a while. Yeah, so I can elaborate on that too, Michael. Um, all the amazing work that you've been doing with um, the the skin to to um, use the custom uh, properties has allowed us to find all a lot of these little cases, especially as we're going through dark mode, that are still have hard coded um, values, uh, either in the SAS files or in their own tool.css files, um, or sorry, tools. Uh, own CSS file. Um, so it, it, this is kind of like an extension of the switch project. The switch project was to help standardize the tools. And, and so by pulling out a lot of this uh, extra redundant code, it, it's really helped clean it up, which makes our job as um, people that are skinning Sakai for our own local institutions much easier because we don't have to worry about going into the nitty gritty of particular pages and particular tools to, to solve those. Dave, I think so. There was some there was some conversation that Chuck's new like um, Python smoker thing had found these, and he right. Yeah, there own. was a whole list. Yeah, that I saw of those. Okay, well that's cool. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. There's already logic that on the Java end to say like, here's where to find the actual skin for this site. Don't use Morpheus, and we just have to connect all those dots together. Okay, great. The other thing that's nice about this too, folks, if you've not um, if you've not messed with um, CSS custom properties at all, is they're they're uh, they're dynamic in the browser, right? So if I go to the HTML element, you'll find them all, um, and I could do things like set the active color to Sakai brand lighter seven, probably really bad move. And then, I don't know, of course, live internet demo doesn't want to work. Mm. What did I do wrong there? There we go, right? And it, I'm only changing it in one place, but all of the CSS selectors that use that property for something actually dynamically update. So it's on the fly dev tools testing and playing around is, is, is dynamic and that's kind of fun. And that kind of, you know, that we could one day, right, have like an admin workspace tool for people who aren't front end developers that could actually like have some color pickers connected to JavaScript, connected to a back end that actually like saved these variables onto the server and I like built the skin live from within admin workspace. That's like theoretically possible with with these CSS custom properties. Yeah, I've been thinking about that a lot, Michael. Um, especially since all the work that you've been doing with these, because it does get us so much closer to being able to do that. Um, I'm not sure if we want to go like the database route with, with um, uh, <laughs> uh, with the uh, saving those values. I'm wondering if, if like a tool like that would just be able to like overwrite custom.css or, or, or sass and uh, make it like essentially generate its own skin file that would just be picked up by Tomcat somehow. That'd be pretty magical to take the load off the database. Oh, you're muted. That I'd have to get that's that's somebody else's territory. Yeah, <laughs> I, I have no clue what would be best there. Um, we'll have to figure that out later. I didn't know that was your 
photo, Adrian. Cool. Um, So anybody that hasn't spoken, I've not done a good job of, of keeping track of who's had a chance, uh, an opportunity to speak uh, and who hasn't. Those who, who haven't had a chance to speak yet, are there things related to you know, UI, front end development, any of that that um, come to mind that you'd like to share with the group today? I also see that we're at are we at time? Does this go to three? It's yeah, it's 40 after. Okay. Um, well, th thank you so much. Um, my contact info. Uh, I'm happy to chat about this stuff whenever with whomever. Feel free to reach out. Um, thanks for your attention today. Cheers. Thanks, Michael.